They are in attendance, and we'll start with uh, Commissioner Cameron. Uh, yes, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Gail Cameron representing the Gaming Commission, and I am present for this meeting. Okay, and Attorney Katonic. Hi, I'm Emily Katonic. I'm the representative from the Treasurer's Office, and I am present for this meeting. And Mr. Umbrello. Hi, I'm Paul Umbrello, Executive Director for New England HBPA and representing the Thoroughbred New England Horsemen, and I am present. Attorney Goldberg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Peter Goldberg, representing the Standard Industry, the HHANE, and the SOM, the Breeders, and I am present for the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm Brian Fitzgerald, the uh, Governor's Designee and Chair of the Committee. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the approval of our minutes from October uh, 7th, 2020. I believe those meeting minutes have been uh, shared with you prior to this meeting for a pre-read. So I just wonder if everyone has had an opportunity to review those minutes. Um, Mr. Chair, I, I know that I have, and I'd be happy to uh, move that the meetings, uh, the meeting minutes um, be approved uh, with any technical corrections that may be necessary. Okay, is there a second to the motion? I'll second that. Okay. Second. All right. All right. So since this is a virtual meeting, we have to take a, a roll call a vote. Uh, uh, Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Attorney Katonic? Aye. Mr. Umbrello? Paul, you're on mute. You're right, sorry. Aye. <laughs> okay, Attorney Goldberg? Aye. And Fitzgerald, aye. Okay, so the minutes are uh, approved. The Next item on the agenda is a review of the Racehorse Development Fund updated uh, revenue. And uh, I don't know if the committee members have um, had a chance to take a look at the um, updated revenue figures are always posted uh, monthly on the um, MassGaming.com website, and Attorney Grossman, do you have? A, are you able to share that link by any chance? Uh, yes, I can post that up here right now. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I guess I would just go probably towards the bottom of the, the, the first page, or actually the second page. It's noted as the second page. This one here? Yep. So, so that way the committee members can see the total allocation over time uh, and the differences between the allocations between the thoroughbreds and the standard breads. Uh, in addition to that, I guess I would go to page, I believe it would be the one, two, three, four, fourth from the last page, where it starts with August 27th, scroll down. And if you just scroll up a little bit more that way, you can see it there. So you can just see the figures there in terms of that was as of our last adjustment um, last summer when we voted to adjust the split at that time. Um, one thing I would just note is I just do my own calculations. So these are not verified or confirmed by the Gaming Commission, but 
Um, I just kind of noted in terms of what I see from these figures that um, roughly in 2019, uh, there was just over $18 million that was allocated to the fund. And obviously with the pandemic affecting um, the world in 2020, the revenues um, were diminished to just over uh, 10 million. So uh, mm -hmm. one thing I would just note is if, if Dr. Lightbaum, if there's any other comments that you want to make to the revenue figures. Um, no, it uh, looks like there's about 19 million in the balance of the fund right now. Uh, that's as of January 21st, and that's our latest, um, that was reported in um, February. Thank you. Do any of the committee members have any questions? I do not. I'm well aware of these numbers. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. So I guess we can uh, move on to the next item on the agenda, which is item four, review and discussion of the present resource development fund distribution percentages, purses, breeding, health and welfare, in consideration of adjusting the recommendations based upon discussions between the thoroughbred and standard bred industries. So I know that this item was, uh, or this was mentioned um, briefly at our, um, at the public hearing that we had uh, last month. And I guess what I would do is um, turn it over to, uh, Attorney Goldberg um, and or Mr. Umbrello um, to uh, kind of enlighten the other members in terms of what your discussions have, in, have entailed. Yeah, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. So I'm very pleased to report that um, after nine years of uh, discussions, nine years of back and forth between all between the two industries as well as the rest of this uh, committee. Um, and upon the urging for those, about eight of those nine years, uh, we've been urged to see if the thoroughbreds and standardbreds could, could actually get together and discuss these issues and try to work out a resolution, um, an, an agreement, so to speak, with the understanding that the Gaming Act and, and Section 60 is intended to help the horse racing industry in Massachusetts, ultimately help the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, but to help the horse racing industry. In Massachusetts, we have two breeds. We have thoroughbred horse racing and standardbred horse racing. We've had that. They both go back many, many, many years, and the history of both has been well documented by this committee and its members over the past nine years. It, it's a pretty storied history uh, on both sides. Um, and I think it's not, it's important to point out that, that the horse racing industry is important in Massachusetts. And it just so happens that there's two different breeds that race, or at least have been racing in the past. And this is why with this committee is put together by the statute, by section 60, to come up with a split that was fair that was fair and we also this committee back in early 2012 talked about that it wasn't a static discussion it wasn't uh, a one a one and done so to speak it was a discussion that we all decided most likely needed to be reviewed and looked at on an annual basis uh, as, as the state of the horse racing industry in Massachusetts would be fluid would continue to be fluid um, for many years. So that's what we've done. We've, this committee has come back every year, looked at the metrics from the prior year, uh, seen what has happened to the, to both industries and, and made, uh, the best adjustments that I think that, that we could under the circumstances. Mr. Umbrello and myself got together weeks ago and started discussing these issues in advance of the 2021 review. Um, 
looking back at the 2020 numbers. Um, you know, what we tried to do was take into account not just the, the statute, not just Section 60 of 23K and uh, all the metrics that go into the split, but take into account what's transpired over the last nine years, transpired what's going on with the thoroughbred industry currently, the standard bread industry currently, and take into account all of the factors. And there's been many that have come up uh, in this committee's discussions over the last eight or nine years. Um, the five criteria that were listed in the statute, and of course, as we all know and have reiterated, uh, those criteria are uh, not limited. We're not limited to those criteria. So we've always looked past and above and beyond the five stated main criteria. Um, and as everyone knows, this, the, the state of the two industries has, has changed dramatically over the last six or seven years. I believe that the Racehorse Development Fund uh, has been a wonderful thing for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and a wonderful opportunity for horse racing in Massachusetts. The, the state of the standard bread industry has, has risen, has, the money has gone uh, to good use, the money has gone to the use uh, for breeding standard bread racehorses, training them, uh, open, keeping open space in Massachusetts. Uh, it, it has really gone to, obviously to the purses, obviously to health and welfare and to the breeding. All the metrics for the standard bids have risen quite uh, substantially over the last five or six years. They've gone up uh, in, in a very uh, positive fashion. In a very, it just it keeps, keeps rising and that's very good. We're not where we want to be or need to be from the standpoint of doing the best for the Commonwealth, but we're certainly on our way as an industry. Unfortunately, the thoroughbred industry um, for, for various reasons, it doesn't have a place to race and have not been, has not been racing. So, uh, you know, we've discussed this. We, we sort of discussed it to death over the last couple of years, I think. Uh, what Mr. Umbrella and I tried to do was, again, sit down, look at all the criteria, look at the history, and look at the present, the numbers from 2020, the metrics, and look at the future and try to come up with what we feel is the best way to split the uh, RHDF between the two industries. We both feel very strongly that the, the new method of doing this, the three buckets as we've, as we've termed them, uh, has allowed us. And, and, and part of the reason why we did this last year was just for this reason, to be able to make the split more effective for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and more effective for both industries. So that's what we did. Um, and uh, Mr. Umbrella and I, you know, spent many, many hours uh, discussing this, going back and forth. Um, and, and I understand his needs for the health and welfare for the thoroughbred trainers um, that's, and jockeys. That's important, uh, as well as what he's trying to do for the breeding. And of course, what he's trying to do uh, for, the, for horse racing as well, for, for live racing. Uh, for the thoroughbreds, so um, we came up with an agreement uh, between between these between the two industries that the three buckets would be split uh, as far as the health and welfare percentage would be split 50 50 this year and that was we talked about that last year as well so we su we suggesting a split of fifty percent to the standard breads and fifty percent to the thoroughbreds for the health and welfare portion. On the breeder's side, on the breeder's bucket, if you will, um, we've come up with a 75% to the standard breads and a 25% of the split to the thoroughbreds. And where the hope, again, is that it'll keep the standard bread, and the same thing with the health and welfare, the hope is the 50-50 split will allow both industries to at the very least keep what they're giving to their uh, membership to the participants to keep that, to keep that going. I don't know. Oop. Can you all still see me and hear me? You're back. Hear me? Okay. Um, 
And the same thing on, on the breeder side, you know, the breeding in Massachusetts uh, for the standard breeds has really taken off. The number of mares, the number of foals, the uh, number of races has really been terrific. And we're hoping that the small increase of the 75% will help that part of the industry continue to thrive and also uh, provide some money for the thoroughbreds who are trying to continue to encourage breeding even without live racing. As far as the purse uh, bucket is concerned, uh, right now there's, there's no racing for thoroughbreds. So we both felt that the, the need for continued money to be put into a purse account uh, substantially less than it has been in the last year or two. So the agreement that we came up with is for the purse uh, percentage, 92% of the RHDF monies for purses goes to the standard bread, standard bread industry with 8% continuing to go to the thoroughbreds uh, for their persons. I'll let Mr. Umbrella add anything if he'd like, and uh, certainly willing to take any questions from anybody. Yep, yeah, no, and, and just to add, because you reiterated kind of pretty much what we talked about for the last couple of weeks, um, and, and it's just that, right? But this has been, been around for nine years. We've had these discussions just that by breaking out the split into the three buckets has just given us that, that opportunity. But, you know, I, I keep hearing it. You know, one of our, our biggest frustrations is, and, and it's no intent of the thoroughbred industry itself, is it's, it's just that. There is no thoroughbred racing, but that doesn't mean, you know, we're, the, the doors are closed, especially on the health and welfare of the breeding aspect. If, if not just the opposite, and I can elaborate in some details on that, um, and that at the same time, we know and we are talking about, you know, Sturbridge, Wareham, racetrack investors um, actively engaged, talking with both um, the commission and should be with this committee. Some have sent letters in in the past. Um, and unfortunately, because of COVID, right, <laughs> even I can tell you at a 50-50 split, the way COVID, if numbers don't adjust, um, we're in, and I've, I've been very vocal with this, with this committee before, we're in significant um, um, trouble, and we'll have to, you know, take some drastic measures. Um, so I'm hoping things do get back to some level of normalcy, and as, as Chairman Fitzgerald opened up the meeting, is, you know, we went from 18 million to 10 million, that's, that shows you what we, what we dealt with last year. Um, so, you know, again, just that, um, the thoroughbred industry, and we've talked about this with prior criteria, doesn't mean because there's no racing, the thoroughbred industry doesn't have to um, theoretically still survive in Massachusetts. And I can tell you prior to this meeting, we're already working on the Breeders Board with submission initiatives for um, campaigns, ads. Um, there's estimates, and I don't want to misspeak, that we are potentially looking at up to eight or more foals, which is a significantly large number than in the past of those numbers um, potentially coming to Massachusetts and being dropped. So, you know, again, we're still alive and kicking, but just that we, we looked at all the, all the, you got to look at the past, right? And we did kind of look at what the future was going to entail. And we both, again, we came up with these, this the conclusion of these numbers. Mr. Chair, I have a couple of questions if, if I'm happy sure. to jump in. Um, sure, first things first, I think it's important that um, that our representatives from each breed have communicated and um, have really um, started the work of this committee. Um, I think, from my uh, from my standpoint, is there documentation as to all of the how you came to these numbers? Um, you know, I I think it is important that we as a committee do our due diligence and. Um, and we take a look at not only hearing more about what you two have come up with, but some of the metrics that have helped us in the past. And, you know, I know Dr. Leipum has been able to provide us many more um, numbers, the number of races, the purses, um, number of licenses, all of the things that, you know, we need to do as a committee to, to make sure our work is is thorough before we are able to send it over the legislature and then to the gaming community. Um, you know, number of uh, people that are benefiting um, from the health and welfare benefits, I thought was really beneficial last year to learn about that so that we, we are able to make good decisions about this. Um, I value the work that you've done, but I, I don't think that's uh, 
especially without a complete docu document that tells us exactly how you examined all of these numbers. Um, I'm, I'm just not comfortable uh, um, stopping here without doing our own due diligence as a committee. Attorney Katana, did you want to comment? Um, I, I think that's a very reasonable position. I mean, I'm happy to hear um, that shifting to the methodology of looking at the three buckets individually has given the parties the space um, to come together and, and propose an agreement. Um, but I would, um, to Commissioner Cameron's point, like to understand a little bit better how the parties reached the proposed splits. Mr. Gilbert, do you want me to add to that some or? Sure. So, so part of it was, is, and we did discuss, so at, at the last meeting we did because of the, the extensive data, the criteria we submitted for the health and welfare bucket, we did um, on the thoroughbred side get an advantage of a 60-40 split. But we've also discussed at that meeting, if I go back and recall, um, discussions were in fairness going forward is that bucket going forward for stability. It's the word here is stability should always be a 50-50 split, right? So that's where we more or less came up with that. I need some form, especially during COVID with stability to know month to month, week to week, I can figure out what's coming in and how we adjust. Now, as far as the health and welfare itself, we've submitted, or I have last year, which hasn't much hasn't changed from the fall. Um, and if anything, our numbers probably increased our bylaws, all our members that benefit and how they qualify and are eligible for those benefits for life insurance, for old age assistance, what makes a member qualified, um, the our health program, our eyeglasses, all that is, is pretty much status quo. And if anything, we've had more members sign up for life insurance and or old age. So hence my concern during COVID that um, my numbers are gonna get a lot tighter. So. That was, again, looking at the criteria for that bucket. Um, as far as the breeding bucket, again, other than the full numbers looking back that are being down, not much has changed um, from those buckets. But in, in fairness, we know we're, we're not for the thoroughbred industry. Again, um, on the breeding side, you know, uh, the doors aren't closed. If anything, we're, we're still doing, and as even um, um, Dr. Lightbaum knows is that we are, we are looking with our breeders bill that's out there, HD 1017, which I'm feeling more and more confident after six years, this year looks like this should pass. That's gonna kickstart our program, but that's for the future, not looking back. Um, the fact that I said we have more foals looking at the future. Um, so I needed in some sense, again, to show stability that there's going to be enough money to pay, as even Mr. Goldberg knows, the 8% for administrative costs just to keep your doors open. And then the fact that, um, you know, showing those that someone who might want to come and drop a fall in Massachusetts or breed on our side more so um, as, as bleak as things are, and we're trying to turn that around, we need that sense of, of stability. So um, we came up with, with um, that percentage. And then as far as when we talk about, and I'll, I'll jump ahead with the whole purse bucket, you know, I keep hearing money grab, money grab, money grab. And I will admit our lobbyists for the last six, seven, eight years fought to secure that racehorse development fund, even during a pandemic. And I hope that continues. I felt that if at the time, because we're looking back that the standard breads obviously could um, uh, benefit with their program at the time being, um, and without that large amount of funding going into the first bucket, we came up with the 92, 8%. And what I, what I would recommend for this committee, and I was gonna ask Council um, Grossman to reconsider again, because I've been being very vocal about this, and this is also something that Attorney Goldberg and myself talked about, is, is that if you really want to preserve a racetrack investor, Sturbridge, Wareham coming into Massachusetts, this committee, as a committee should be looking at securing the resource development fund, escrowing that money, because by doing that, regardless of the 92.8%, you're now assuring that the Wareham folks and the Sturbridge folks, which I continuously communicate um, with, that would just reassure them that they have the kickstart of that 19, 20 million, probably by the time we're done this year, um, to kick off a, a 
somewhat of a mute once the racetrack is built. And again, because we look back and not forward, a racetrack would have to be up and running and, and operable for a given year unless we make some sort of exception. And this committee has an emergency meeting. We would have to look at what, you know, let's say 2022, if someone got a track up and running, we would have to look and see what that program um, would look like as far as the number of races. So all, all that factored in as to how we came up with, with these numbers. I don't know if you want anything else. Very no, I, I, I do think the numbers are important for the committee to look at, not just two members of the committee. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I just feel like um, I still don't have a good understanding of how you got there because you didn't mention that you looked at these factors and what numbers led you to this. And I do think it's important that we see every year yep. um, you know, there are many, many stakeholders in racing. On the thoroughbred side, there is not, um, there is not just one group. There are many groups that are very, very interested in this. And, um, and I think it's so important for this committee to take the time to do the work, to look at the numbers, to make sure, and it's not that I don't believe what you're saying, it's just that I'd like to see how many people are benefiting from health and welfare. You said those numbers have gone up. I would, you know, it would be nice to see that. Exactly where the dollars have gone uh, over this year. This is a new year we're looking at. So I, um, I would like to see those numbers. I would like, I know Dr. Uh, Lightbaum can pull together the numbers that she does typically every year. And I know that your associations can pull those numbers. I'm not asking for a 30 page brief, but just some numbers that helped you get to these. These are very different uh, numbers than what this committee has decided on in the past. So I, I just, I believe we need more due diligence here. And just for clarification, so the, the, the present split for health and welfare benefits was 60 to the thoroughbreds, 40 to the standard breads. And your proposal is to amend that to 50, 50, a 50 50 split. The breeders was 70% to the standard breads, 30% to the thoroughbreds. And you're amending that or proposing to amend that to 75 uh, 25. And the current purse allocation is 70% to the standard breads and 30% to the thoroughbreds with a 92% split to the standard breads and 8% to the thoroughbreds, correct? Correct. That's, okay. that's correct. And I, 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 can certainly, I can certainly appreciate uh, Commissioner Cameron's request for documentation, you know, and that's, uh, we're, we're always, I'm always caught between, you know, trying to do what everyone asks to, to get along and try to figure this out and to be thorough um, and I get that. And we, we've, we've come back with 30 some odd page or more reports every, every year. Um, but a big, and, and, I, and I get that Commissioner Cameron, and I don't, I don't necessarily disagree with your assessment. But as, as far as, you know, the health and welfare and the breeders, we're talking about very small changes on both of those. The only change that is, uh, is, any, is of any right. significance right now is the purse bucket, right? Going from 70% to 92%. And the biggest part, I think, I think Mr. Umbrello stated correctly, it's in keeping everything stable, keeping things stable. And we've talked about that stability uh, for many, many years. And that's how uh, horse racing as an owner, trainer, breeder is not a one year deal. You can't get into the business for a year. I mean, you, you can, but you really can't. If you buy a horse, if you breed a horse, it's it's three years before it's two years old and it can start racing and all that stuff. So when we looked at the purse bucket, 2020, the purse structure at Blaine Ridge was a certain number. And I don't have, I'm not, I wasn't prepared to give you all the figures and numbers, but we, we raced less than 70 days, right? Three months weren't raced because of COVID. Um, the, the per structure was higher for those, because of those 60 days. Um, you know, going forward now in 2021, uh, it's gonna be challenging to keep the per structure the same going back to the 100 plus race days of racing. So that was, that was part of the uh, 
our discussions was that we need more money just to keep the purse structure as it was last year. And the thoroughbreds once again will not be racing live racing. So we felt like their current amount that is in that it is that they have for purses that has not been earmarked for purses yet is more than sufficient to keep their race hopes stable and and alive for the future. So that's how we came up with that without without completely making it a hundred to zero, which you know maybe it should be, but um, I think there was a compromise on both sides. Yeah, Mr. Goldberg, my issue is um, I, I take calls all the time from folks in the racing industry. They'll call me uh, and because they know I, I sit on this committee. And um, if I am asked, well, how did these numbers come about? I can't answer that question right now because I wasn't part of the two of you working on this and you're giving me generics on how you got there without really talking specifics and talking numbers and I, I do think that work is important to do um, and I know I am not comfortable um, agreeing with this work without knowing more seeing a document you know, you know or, or doing our work as a committee um, with with what you're each telling me now just how you got there very generic uh, well, if I may, I'm sorry, Commissioner Kim, it wasn't as generic as when you looked at 2020, again, pretty much everything was status quo. Other than the live racing element, we had no race days, right? So, and again, no matter, and what Mr. Goldberg said was, is in the, from my side, the legal expenses it took to put a 40-page briefing together, with all due respect, I could still make the argument that under the racing program, I would beat the standard breads with W-2s, 1099s or not. But in the end, the way this committee always voted year after year, a five ten percent adjustment um, was pretty much based on live live race days. If if I go back and look at it, at the history of that, right? And then we've always said from day one, the purse, well, sorry, the health and welfare bucket should always be fifty fifty percent, so that both breeds can have some level of of stability. Sir, so we, can, we have never made still... that decision as a committee. As a committee, we have never made that decision. You're the, this is your first year on the committee, and that's not yep. something we've ever done. Um, I thought if we pull last meeting minutes, we talked about the 60-40 and thought it would be fair at the next hearing, probably just to keep it at a 50-50 split. Maybe I'm... Um, I don't, mix, I don't recall that. that. That's and, okay. Nope. Yep. But even then, look, looking at past history of the committee with a 5 to 10% adjustment to Mr. Goldberg's point where, again, I can still submit all the, the data on the, on the breeding aspect. Not much is going to change other than the two foals. Our foals are down. We probably had two. That's what I'm saying. This year, we expect to have eight. So I, I don't yeah. think it should be hard. You have it in your head just to quickly put those numbers together. So this committee can do its work based on the criteria that we were put together to do. So can I ask it a different way to this committee? If Mr. Goldberg and I put a briefing together and we both make recommendations, because that's the other thing is that I wasn't always fond of the bantering back and forth between the two breeds and us saying we have more stallions than you do and more foals, right? That's really not what the intent of this committee should be, is to just see who, who should benefit greater. It's not the reward fund, it's the development fund. And that's where, again, when we, when we look and go back at the history, it should be to promote and develop the industry. So... Um, you know, other than paying the exorbitant amount of legal expenses um, to me it only it only made sense but Mr. Umbrello and attorney Goldberg I mean I think when when we met back in October we kind of agreed to a, agreed to a timeline which was that you know executive summaries would be submitted by February 26th and yep. then we'd have a meeting on March 10th, where we discuss those ex executive summaries and consider a change to the distribution percentage. So, so I guess in terms of in, in terms of satisfying you know some of the questions that are being raised by the committee members, um, Mr. Umbrello, you kind of alluded to it in terms of preparing some a brief or an executive summary that kind of outlines some of the discussions. Um, what are the obstacles to that in terms of cost and timing and things, you know, in terms of putting something together, I guess. 
Is that directed towards myself? Well, to, to, to oh. either or, or both of you. So. Yeah, look again, my, and, and I didn't finish the comment. Sorry, was is that oh. if, if Mr. Goldberg and I, both of us put a briefing together that literally we agreed on the split we just um, <laughs> recommended, uh, I guess I'm curious how the committee would end up taking that into, into consideration. Um, for myself, while sitting on this board and having prior counsel, um, I'm going to have to probably take a significant amount of time, depending on what these briefings are going to, uh, again, consist and look like. Because, I, again, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort for something that's so important that, you know, I think we've kind of nailed down down in a, a between the two breeds, an agreeable split. Um, and that I thought was always the intent. We always were seen to talk about sit down and meet and talk, sit down and meet and talk. You know, this just shows unity and stability, but um, I understand some of the members on this committee, their position. Um, I'm, I'm gonna need a significant amount of time because I might now want to bring on new counsel. I might have to bring new counsel up to speed. Um, I'm gonna have to budget for that as well. And uh, I'll probably have to pull last year's criteria and uh, review it. I don't know about you, Mr. Mr. Goldberg. Well, yeah, you know, I, I think originally, uh, Mr. Chairman, you, you were correct. We did have a, uh, a, a schedule uh, to have the posing, posing briefs submitted by February, I think the 26th, and then a March date. Um, unfortunately, after the last public hearing meeting and some discussions that we all had, um, I, I felt or I thought apparently mistakenly that uh, we'd be able to come to the board, come to the committee today with with an agreement that we could discuss and talk about and, and hopefully vote on. That that said, uh, you know, I understand the need for, um, I understand what Commissioner Cameron's saying. Um, I, th I think what Mr. Umbrella was asking, and, and, and if I'm wrong, Paul, interrupt me, uh, is would, they, would this committee and Commissioner Cameron, Chairman Fitzgerald, and Attorney Katanik, you know, would you be willing to accept one brief from both, a combined brief from both breeds that discusses the figures? Um, you know, my, my, my issue, quite honestly, Commissioner Cameron and everyone else is, is timing, right? I, I've tried over every year for nine years to get this discussion done in the spring before racing starts because again that word stability comes up it's used and it's important it's important for the for, for, for not just the the HHANE the SOM but, but for the racetrack itself for, for 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 management to plan the season to plan races if they want to have a big race in June or July the funds for that have to be earmarked marketing has to be done uh, you, you can't run races, you know, in, in October, for, you know, for July. You, you got to plan ahead. So, uh, again, I, I, I've pushed hard, and, and I and I appreciate Mr. Umbrella's willingness. Um, in my opinion, he's been very willing to uh, to work in a, in a faster pace than in the past, and to work with the standard breads to at least get this done whatever the outcome may be, at least get it done before racing starts so that it gives us some time to plan the season and to, and to use the money. You know, the key is, you know, the, the bottom line is the key is what benefits the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. That's really, I, I, in my opinion, that's what the statute's all about. And there's two industries that we're going to get, that in, you know, historically got decimated by, uh, by, legalized gambling in other states and you know what the history shows us that other states had to put some protections in place uh, for for horse racing industries otherwise they could get wiped out by legalized gambling so it, it, it's it's been in place we've worked hard and again so right now my, my my issue is you know if we if we need if we need two separate you know opposing you know knock them over drag them out beat the other side up briefs. Um, I hear what Paul Umbrello is saying. You know, if he's got to hire someone to do this, is, is it going to be another time where, you know, we, we get this done in October, 
then I have to yell and scream to try to do it retroactive. But then, you know, in October, it's hard to spend the money if you get it anyway. Um, you know, my Mr. hope was, yeah, I'm sorry. Mr. Goldberg, we, we, we have, I share your frustration that we have had quorum issues over the years, but that is not the case with the makeup of this committee. This committee has been very responsive to the needs of uh, the breeds and our responsibilities to uh, work in a timely manner. I think, you know, we can see that. That's evidenced here. Um, but what I'm not willing to do is um, is sacrifice the, the the work that we do, which is by statute, what the things that we should look at. Um, I don't find it uh, impossible to pull together numbers. Again, um, I, I, I preface my comments by saying we don't need a 30-page brief, but I would like to see more documentation on um, on some of these numbers and what was what was looked at, and just not the generic explanations. And um, I appreciate every year, and I think it's important for us to look at. Um, uh, you know, uh, the numbers from uh, Dr. Lightbaum, just how many races, how much of the purse money, just things that we sh should be looking at, as well as um, I love that we were able to split out uh, into the buckets, as we call them, the three buckets, but knowing um, who is utilizing that money is, is part of our responsibility as well. So I would like to take a little bit of time, and it doesn't have to be a lot of time, to pull together those um, those numbers, um, and whether we call it an executive summary as opposed to a brief, I just think that would be important before I'm comfortable moving in any direction on uh, any of these three buckets. No, I, I, I agree, Commissioner Cameron, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I, I truly do. My, my only, I, I think what Paul and I are trying to find out really from this committee is, is you know, and I think especially Mr. Umbrella was trying to find out, you know, what will satisfy this committee as far as the documentation you know is it something that we can work on together as a horse racing industry and get something to you in in two weeks possibly um you know again if what's if uh, i mean i guess that's the question i think that mr umbrella was trying to get answered you, you know if we if we if we work together uh we pool our resources try to save some money right so that we're not just beating each other over the head for, for the next month or so. Uh, and we somehow do this as one document. Is that okay? Is that sufficient? Will that satisfy this committee or, or not? You know, it, 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 and I think if, if he needs to, what I'm hearing, and maybe I'm wrong, is if he needs to hire a new attorney and, and bring him up to speed, I'm hearing time. That's all. Yeah, and if I may add to that, sorry. Um... Chairman Fitzgerald, the last time we also met is we took the format of the criteria, which again, guideline, not a guideline, we, we factored it all in. So what's, what's the weight? I always say each bucket should be weighted, but that's for another day. Um, are we going to follow, and to Mr. Goldberg's point, that would be my question, is, do, am I going to follow or have to follow that same format? Because that's what takes the, the time to go to the different places and gather all that data validate it, different resources, and, and put something together, and then defend it. Well, I, I think I'm, I'm encouraged by the fact that, that there's been a discussion between, between the two of you. Um, I guess I would turn to Attorney Grossman and say, in terms of some a, a joint memorandum of sorts that kind of explains the logic and reasoning behind their proposed agreement. Is there any sort of legal impediment for them to present that, for the two industries to present that to the committee? Well, the, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. That, it's a, a good question. They, members of the committee or any board uh, can't share their opinions with the other members outside of a public meeting. Um, so to the extent there's some document prepared by members of this group, it cannot be shared in advance. If it's share, if prepared by someone else, then it can be circulated. Um, the alternative would be 
to post it publicly so members of the public can see the document at the same time the rest of the members are seeing it. Um, and, and then you can do it in advance of the meeting, but it's not just shared uh, with the board. And that way you add a layer of transparency that the open meeting law requires to the process. And people know that decisions haven't been made behind closed doors or before and outside of public meetings. So there are some options, but there are also some uh, obstacles um, involved. And Commissioner Cameron, just so in terms of in terms of your concerns, um, would you be looking for to, to stay with following the timeline that we set forth last fall in terms of the executive summaries, or would it, a joint memorandum explaining the logic and reasoning behind their proposed agreement? Yeah, I, I, the timeline is not my concern um, the, to sticking to a timeline. I, I understand the urgency of the work, uh, but I do think we need some documentation and you know, transparency is a very good word to use in this situation because right now I know that I don't have the information I need to justify any decision. So I would like to see that and I don't have a preference as to how it's prepared, uh, but I do, um, I do heed uh, Attorney Grossman's words that it needs to be done in a transparent way. And if it's posted ahead of time and we could see it, I, I'm fine with that. The other thing to just consider to kind of break through some of this is to the extent there's just some data or numbers that don't reflect someone's opinion, they're just facts, we can share those in advance without a problem. It's only when you start talking about the reason you did something or you think something that it becomes problematic. But if it's just a breakdown as to all the expenses of an association or how certain money was spent or what the number of foals was or something like that, that's not an opinion, that's a fact. Um, and you can circulate that. And Attorney Katanik, did you have any further comments? I think I would sort of echo the comments that Commissioner Cameron has made. I think part of the work of this committee over the past couple of years has been to put in place a standard and a thorough, um, no pun intended actually, <laughs> um, <laughs> process um, that's predictable. Um, and I think that now that we sort of finally have that process in place, um, I would be hesitant for us to stray away from that. I think we should sort of stick to the schedule. And I think I would be okay considering the numbers because it sounds like that's something that would be a little bit easier to pull together. Um, and then sort of hearing the, the oral arguments as you will at the next meeting instead of um, having to pull together, you know, a, a lengthy and time consuming and expensive brief. Right. That, and, and that's, and that's, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, and I think. No, no, Mr. Chairman, I was just going to say, yeah, I think, I think pulling together the data, the numbers, um, hopefully could be done um, in an expeditious fashion at this point and, and getting, getting those numbers from 2020 together, hopefully between uh, as Dr. Lightbound has always been extremely helpful in getting those, those, those numbers together. We've seen her help as well as the thoroughbred breeders and thoroughbred, uh, the NEHBPA, as well as the HHA and ANSOM. I think we could get the numbers, the, the raw data together hopefully fairly quickly. And as I think attorney Katanik said, then we can, then we can sort of present our opinion on those numbers on the data at our next meeting. This, and then as Commissioner Cameron has, suge Cameron has suggested, uh, have that discussion about the numbers, about the data, about the metrics, and then come up with a uh, transparent and uh, well-reasoned decision. 
it, it sounds like that can be done maybe pretty close to the schedule that we set back in October, if not, if not right on that schedule. Remind me of those, remind me of those dates. Hold on, I'm looking. Where are they? I think it was February 26th for the, for the data, for the executive summaries and March 10th, maybe for our meeting. Next meeting yeah. That sounds right. You know, maybe, maybe what we could do um, is extend the first date a week. Maybe get the data uh, submitted by March 3rd. Give us, a, because it's only, the 26th is only nine days away. Maybe get the data to this committee or posted, you know, publicly by March 3rd. And then um, keep that March 10th date for, for a meeting. That honestly might be too aggressive for myself, but. Well, hopefully, Paul, we can work at least work yep. together nope. together. I use the word loosely nope. um, to get all the, the, the metrics in to to the committee. I mean, Dr. Lightbound would know probably best if all those numbers and metrics are available, if you will, of at least the five criteria, main criteria. Right. I was going to ask where the 2020 numbers are. Do we have those yet? The um, numbers that I developed that are on that racing and uh, horse racing in Massachusetts, those those are all um, pretty much gathered already. Um, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I think usually there's a couple of pages of financials out of the annual report that you um, folks asked for, mm -hmm. and I might need to be reminded um, which ones those are, and um, I could have um, our financial analyst work on those. You'd probably get them out within the next week or so. And so then, are you both proposing then having raw data submitted as of March 3rd with a meeting taking place as on March 10th? I, I would be I would be okay with that, and I think we could get um, hopefully get most, if not all, the numbers together by March third. I'll I'll in good faith shoot for that date, but with the caveat, I might need an extra week depending on okay. how readily available things are and pulling it all together. Uh, Commissioner Cameron, does that? Uh, yes, I, I would be, um, that sounds very reasonable to me. Attorney Katanek, is that? That works for me too. Okay, all right, okay. Okay, so then do we want to uh, have a motion to continue our discussions with having raw data submitted by March 3rd and then um, scheduling a meeting for March 10th where the two respective industries can then present uh, their proposed agreement. So I, I would I would make that motion, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would move that the committee uh, table its discussion on the uh, current review of the RHDF um, and uh, have the data, the metrics necessary for to continue our review process uh, presented by uh, by both industries on or before March 3rd, 2021, with uh, in keeping with our current schedule with the next meeting of the committee uh, to be March 10th of 2021 at, at 2 p.m. to review that data, discuss that data, and uh, 
potentially vote on a, any uh, split that needs to be changed. Second. 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 Okay. Motion carries. So then we will take a uh, roll call vote on the motion. Uh, Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Attorney Katunuk? Aye. Mr. Umbrello? I'm contemplating, I'm sorry. Can you skip me go to Mr. Goldberg for a second? Doesn't matter. I might have just, aye, go ahead. Mr. Goldberg? Aye. And Fitzgerald, aye. Okay. All right. So we are now at the point then where the raw data would then be submitted as of March 3rd, and we would be uh, rescheduling our discussion regarding the uh, proposed distribution split percentages as of March 10th at 2 p.m. Okay. Are there any other comments, questions that any of the committee members have? Uh, Chairman Fitzgerald, I'm sorry because I'm not sure I heard it was answered. Are we using the criteria format to fill in the raw data that was recommended at the last briefing? Or is it a skinny down version of that? I believe, I th think the intent seems to be that it's a skinnied out version of it based on what you're talking about for your agreement. And I think we just kind of need the information as to how that uh, the proposed agreement is arrived at. Okay, just want to make sure, that's what I thought, I just want to make sure I was clear, sorry. Thank you. But, uh, but enough information to make a good decision, obviously, not correct. Yeah, as much as much of the raw data as I mean, hopefully all the raw data that we've had in the past can be updated and presented from 2020 to to help uh, with the discussions regarding any review. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other comments, questions? Seeing none, then. Uh, I ask for a motion to adjourn this meeting. So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> right. And based on a roll, roll call vote, Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Attorney Katanek? Aye. Mr. Umbrello? Aye. Attorney Goldberg? Aye. And Fitzgerald? Aye. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very all. much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Bye, you everybody. Enjoy. Thank you. Stay well. Stay well. Be safe. Take care. Bye.